Hi, welcome. Welcome to the talk that we're going to do today. We're going to be going over the state of the state of asthma and talking about guidelines and the recent changes that have happened in the in the world of asthma. This talk goes out to two different audiences. One is the APP to APP group, and the second group is My Catholic Doctor. So those two groups will be taking part and hopefully listening. That's me on the screen. That's my name, Brian Bezik, and you are free to reach out to me. My cell phone is there, and you can text me if you have questions. Any um, concerns either, you can, my email's there, and that really is open to anyone. If you want to reach out to me, I'll be happy to answer your questions. I do uh, pulmonary care along with some urgent care and administrative stuff in, in Boise, Idaho, and the surrounding towns. And I've been doing this for over 20 years now, so have a lot of experience, and that has left me a desire to kind of pass this on. And the other neat thing about this is that asthma is changing. For a long time, we didn't have a lot of new things. We had some new inhalers, but not a lot of new therapies. And the guidelines were pretty stagnant for quite a while. Then everything started to change, and we saw dramatic changes in both asthma and COPD, Asthma guidelines changed starting about five years ago, and we'll go into that and what those changes mean. Some of those changes have filtered out to family practice and to non-pulmonary specialists, but some haven't. And so that's what I want to do. I want to catch you up on that. Where are we at with asthma? What are we doing with therapy and treatment? How do we, you know, is there things I should be doing differently? Do I just still give patients, you know, fluticasone or whatever? Is there is there newer inhalers? Is there better therapy? What about triple therapy? We're going to cover that, all right? And so that's what we're going to do for the next 50 minutes or so. So sit back and relax. Hope this is enjoyable. We go fast so you don't fall asleep. And again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. I do have some um, conflicts, not really anything with what we're going to cover today. Down at the bottom, I put that I will not discuss anything that's not FDA indicated, except for one important caveat, and that is that the GINA and US guidelines both make recommendations that are not FDA approved. So we have worldwide acceptance of certain treatments. The FDA has not taken these up. I don't know when they will, but um, so those are not FDA indicated. The meds are and the indications are, but the way we deliver the medications and the way you write your prescription, that is not FDA approved. However, it's being done widely and it is very well accepted. And I think certainly defendable if that's what you choose to do. Darth Vader has been traumatizing asthma patients, and, and I'm old enough that I went to Star Wars when it opened in California, so I remember Darth Vader. I was a little kid, and he scared me then. So we're going to review the medication classes and then talk over guidelines and review the best practices. The, the medications, to me, I think if you start any asthma talk with this, it sets us up for success because there are three types of medicines. That's it. There's lots of inhalers and there's different shapes and sizes, but there's three types, three classes. How we use those three classes is the core of treatment for asthma and COPD, both. So let's refresh that. Let's just kind of get those three classes in our head. And I think once you understand, okay, there's these three groups, I'm going to start with this one and then move up. It makes, I think, more sense. All right. So that's why we're going to do that part. I'm going to spend just a few minutes on that, but need to do that because then when we get to the guidelines, the guidelines kind of make sense. Okay, class, we'll start with this one and then we're going to move up and that's what we need to do, all right? And it makes sense, I think, also when we come, why did the guidelines change? What, what did we do differently? What needed to change? Well, at the core is these three categories of medicines and how they're different and how they're a little bit different and how we understand them. So that's why we're going to do that. Real quick, big picture is that there's asthma and COPD, two different disease states. One patient can have both. You can have asthma and smoke and get COPD for sure. Asthma is constriction, inflammation, and mucus. That's the three core caveats of asthma. Things get tight, airways get swollen, and you make more mucus. It often starts in childhood. In fact, most often it does, but it can happen anytime. And it's, you know, there's definite triggers and it comes and goes. The variability of asthma is a core feature of the diagnosis. You can't really diagnose it without that variability. You have to show that there's a change rapidly to albuterol to even get the diagnosis. Uh, most of the time, there's one there's one alternative to that too. COPD is tissue destruction, right? It's, it's I've destroyed my lung tissue either purposely with tobacco or maybe environmental smoke or exposure or genetically with alpha-1 antitrypsin. So that's tissue destruction generally over time, generally due to exposure, the genetic one exception is alpha one. Um, and, and it's usually 
they're not always, almost usually what we're going to see is in older patients, right? They've, they've had to have had exposure over a period of years. So COPD is just tissue destruction. I just want to set that aside. This is not our topic, but set that into a different category because, because tissue destruction is at the core of COPD, we treat it differently. However, it's the same three classes of medicines. It's the same three options when it comes to the categories, but we're going to treat it differently because it's just destruction. The alveoli aren't there anymore. All right. Asthma, constriction, airway inflammation, and mucus. Things tighten down. Lungs that should be this big are this big. Okay. Airway linings that are should be this big are thick. So the middle gets smaller because everything's getting thicker. And then I'm going to make mucus. Most of the time, this is your body's response or the patient's response to something in the air, maybe a trigger, maybe an infection, maybe a viral infection, but it's a response and an immune response, often an exaggerated immune response to the world. That's asthma. Okay. So big picture asthma is those big three COPD's exposure. Let's focus on asthma. All right. Guidelines just real quick, just to set the stage is the United States, we came up with our uh, the, the last full guideline update was 2007. First year of the iPhone, by the way. That's how long it's been. Then we had a partial update in 2020, and that was not a full update. GINA, the Global Initiative for Asthma, is updated annually, and it's their 30th year. This year is the 30th year of GINA. So we have these two guidelines. Unfortunately, the U.S. guidelines are not current, really. The 2020 update did help for sure, but they're just not current. So most everyone uses the GINA guidelines. That's probably what, if you see an online article, they're not usually citing the U.S. guidelines, although they can. So that's the guidelines. So we'll get that. Okay. So burn of asthma is still very common. Um, I don't have it on this slide, but let me just kind of forward these. But every day in America, 40,000 people miss school or work. 30,000 people have an asthma attack. 5,000 people visit the ER or urgent care. 1,000 people and 11 people pass away every day. We have a little over 4,000 deaths. I need to add it there. 4,000 deaths in this country every year from asthma. So it's still, uh, uh, it, there's a lot of loss of school and work, but it still is potentially fatal. And the the I don't have this slide on the, in this slideshow, but most over half of the patients that actually succumb to asthma and pass away, if you look back at their chart, there's two things that, that are very interesting, I think, in, in doing retrospective analysis on patients that have succumbed to asthma. One is a little over half their diagnosis was mild asthma. Yeah, it wasn't severe, uh, severe persistent. These patients, now they were misdiagnosed, but but that's just because you look back and it's mild. The other thing, the one consistent key is overuse of albuterol, which is why Gina did what they did a few years ago. But overuse of albuterol, more frequent refills of their albuterol than they should have. That is a huge red flag. So let's get off that topic, but that's just kind of sets the stage. Asthma is a heterogeneous disease. We've got different subtypes and different endotypes that we treat now. Um, we're not going to get into that very specifically, but we definitely have ways that we treat asthma patients differently depending on when they got asthma and whether they have allergic asthma or non-allergic asthma. But it's a, it's a disease characterized by inflammation, constriction, and mucus. I'm going to say that a lot more. <laughs> You're going to hear those big three a lot. It's divine. The, the history is defined by history of respiratory symptoms such as wheeze, shortness of breath, tightness, and cough that are highly variable, okay? Now, I'll two things. One is the variability part. That's critical to asthma. COPD is every day. They have good days and bad days, and they can have exacerbations, and we often see them when they're sick. But asthma is all over the case. It should roller coaster. That's what asthma does in, in response to what's going on. So it's a highly variable. And the last thing I'll say right there is cough. You can't. I don't think it's possible, humanly possible to have asthma and not cough. If you're wondering about somebody and you're wondering what kind of what's going on, you can ask that question. Do you cough with kids? Like I want to know two things. Do they cough with activity and do they cough at night? Coughing is the response to the tightness and the constriction and the mucus. Sometimes they cough and maybe get something up, but that tight, <clears throat> that respiratory tight asthma cough which is so, I mean, my brain is tuned in. I hear it in the waiting room. I'm like, oh, there's an asthma cough. That has got to be part of asthma. If they're not coughing, you can be relatively certain they don't have asthma. If they say, no, I don't, I hardly ever cough, then I'm thinking something else, right? Maybe a restrictive disease or whatever. Okay, so 
Terms real quick, Saba is short-acting beta agonist. That means albuterol, pro ventil, and proventil, all names, rescue, puffer. All of those are terms that we'll use interchangeably here. LABA is the same thing. I tell patients a long-acting beta agonist, I say, this is just albuterol, but it's a kind of albuterol that lasts for 12 hours or maybe 24 hours, okay? So that's a long-acting beta agonist. When you see ICS, that's a steroid, that's Flovent, Fluticasone, Qvar, Pumacard, all different types of inhaled corticosteroids. We, they, and steroids come in every form, right? It's the only medicine you can get in a cream, in a gel, in an inhaler, inject it, suppository, pill. You know, and it, it, steroids come in every form imaginable. Llama, now this is the one category that maybe we're kind of familiar with, but probably the least so. Muscarinic agents muscarinic antagonists are the llamas and the samas, okay? These are, for instance, what's found in Spreva, which is a generic teotropium. These are bronchodilators is their category. I'm gonna show you why that's kind of a, not a great term, but these dry up mucus and they help dilate. So that's what this category does. That's why this category is the preferred category for COPD while it's the last one for asthma. If So we're gonna talk about those in just a second. MDI meter dose inhaler and then DPI, if you see that, that's a dry powder inhaler. So it's just a medicine that comes in a dry powder. The one thing about DPIs is they're as they sit in the inhaler in Advair or Wixella is the generic for that, as they sit in the inhaler, they are inactive and you have to disaggregate those molecules to get them to work. So DPIs do take a little more force to inhale. Not as big a deal with asthma, but that is a huge issue with COPD. And a big part of my talk on COPD is just what if they're not getting the medicine in, okay? So that's that's some terms. Okay, so we've got three categories. These three blue boxes, let's fill them in. The first category is the albuterol category. So it's just albuterol, whether it's a short acting and we call it albuterol, whether it's a long acting and we call it a long acting beta agonist. These are bronchodilators. They take tight airways and make them bigger. That's their job, okay? Smooth muscle contracts, constricts, gets smaller, smaller, Let's relax that. Let's force those muscles to relax and open them up. If it's albuterol, I'm getting the medicine all at once and it lasts a couple of hours and goes away. Now, how long albuterol lasts is inverse <laughs> to how much tightening there's, how sick they are. The sicker the patient, the less time albuterol lasts because the sicker they are, the harder the body's trying to contract, right? It's pushing and the albuterol is relaxing. So how well the albuterol works is gonna be opposite of how sick you are, right? And it's just because it's fighting this battle. That's why I say albuterol will always work. It always does its job. It always does it. But if the body's fighting hard, it may take more to get where I feel relief and unlock those lungs. That's why sometimes we'll give them a neb treatment, wait a couple minutes, give them another one, and then I'll stack a third. I don't have any problem stacking three nebs in a row, which is equivalent to about nine puffs of albuterol if needed in the, in the right. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying that if we need to get it in and we're certain there's bronchoconstriction, you can keep giving albuterol and eventually it'll break through. Some things about albuterol, it's a short acting bronchodilator, relaxes smooth muscle. I'm a chemistry guy. So binds to bed receptors on smooth muscle causing a billion exactly things to happen and the calcium drops and the cell relaxes. So that's what it's doing. It's causing the muscles to relax, get it in there. It'll do its job. Salmeterol, formoterol, valanerol, just the same thing. They're just albuterol, but they last 12 or 24 hours, depending on the medicine, okay? Left, same airway, left-hand side is constricted, right-hand side is relaxed. That's the difference. Breathing through a straw or breathing through an airway, all right? What a difference, right? But if you get it in there, it'll help. Now with COPD, let me pause for a second and get on a tangent, which I will do a lot. This isn't happening a ton for most COPDers without asthma. So it one, one interesting thing is, okay, if this isn't happening, if the COPD is the one on the, well, it's on my right, I don't know which side it is for you because I think my camera's flipped, but if it, the big one, all right, if that's the COPD, why would I give them albuterol? Why would I tell my COPD to have an albuterol inhaler? If that's, if they're on the other side, why would I do that? Well, they may not be tight, but the answer to that little trivia question, and I've asked lots of people of all different <laughs> medical backgrounds, physicians on down, and, and the answer is there's resting tone. We all have some level of resting tone. So if I relax that resting tone, I can make it even a little bigger 
than it normally is. And that's why albuterol long and short acting can be helpful for COPD. So now you know the trivia question. These are the inhalers, overwhelming, I know. But anyway, those right there are the albuterols. So if I want an inhaler with just this first class, just albuterol, short acting, that's my options. If I want albuterol that's long acting, okay, I've got this option over here, okay? I've got Cerevent, which most people don't use, but it's still out there, all right? If I want albuterol long acting with something else, so I've got the albuterol part and I'm gonna add something on top, I've got that category. Okay, so albuterol by itself, short acting, albuterol by itself, long acting, which we call LABA, and then LABAs with something long acting. Now, this will be updated, and I'll show you. This is, well, this has already changed. This one is two years old, but this is already, there's, there's a long acting um, steroid, if you will, and then a short acting bit agonist that's new, and it's coming out next month, or it'll be widespread use next month. So I'll show you that in a second. This is where you can get this download if you want. So if you want to get this, it's the Asthma and Allergy Network. They are a nonprofit. I'm not selling you anything. You can download this for free. You can buy copies. They're a group um, that's started by a mom who didn't have resources. And um, anyway, they're an amazing group. They're, they don't, there's no profit here. They produce all these posters. You can get posters in Spanish. Great resource for you. All right, that's first group. All right, set that aside. Second group is the steroids. They're all long acting. None of them are short acting. That does that. The long and short acting doesn't really apply. They reduce inflammation and they don't really care why you have the inflammation. I don't care. Are you sick? I don't care. You inhale, you roasted. I had a guy that roasted marshmallows last summer. I just remember because it was like my first worst exacerbation from what I think was roasting marshmallows. But anyway, it doesn't care. I don't care why you have it. They, steroids don't care, right? Honey badger don't care. They don't care. They're going to knock down inflammation. Corticosteroids bind to the receptor and they change the genes, right? They're going to change how the cells function. Many, many effects. I think this is interesting. I will not read that line to you, but if you're bored, I think the way steroids work is fascinating. And this is a tiny snippet of what they do. But every inflammatory mediator, almost, not all of them, but almost every inflammatory mediator is suppressed when you give steroids. Okay, just keep that in mind. So many actions, one goal of reducing inflammation, most aspects of inflammation are affected. So you really do reduce inflammation dramatically with steroids. Now they're getting into the cell, they're getting into the DNA. So are they gonna work in 10 minutes? No, right? I've had people that say they take their you know, steroid inhaler, their fluticasone and it helps in 10 minutes. It can't, but that's okay. You know, If it helps, it helps, right? But it's not really doing anything at the source in that time. This, I think, is just interesting. Hopefully, this is a little bit of a side note, but this is our own steroids. We all have them inside of us. Look at look on the far left. 8 a.m., they're peaking, right about 8 a.m. So this is testosterone, estrogen. The suppressive steroids that keep our inflammation down are at their peak in the morning, and they're at their trough at night. And one of these was cortisol, and the other one was... I don't remember. It doesn't really matter. The lines are, they, they're just slightly off. It doesn't really matter. They, they're at their lowest in the morning. I mean, uh, they're, yeah, they're at their lowest um, at night. Excuse me. I said that backwards. So highest in the morning, lowest at night. Now, remember, if I give you prednisone and I say, here's 40 milligrams of prednisone, take it at dinner. You're going to sleep? No. Four hours later when that hits, those steroid levels are high and you know patients don't sleep, right? They're up all night. They want to eat everything and punch the wall. That's the side effects of prednisone. We have to have low levels of steroids to sleep. So our steroids have to be at their lowest when we sleep. They have to be at their highest when we're awake. This is why asthma cough at night is so problematic and so different. Cough at night is different than daytime cough for this reason right here, all right? And this is why, like, I'll, I will do what's called chrono dosing and I'll dose the prednisone or, met, you know, pediapred or whatever we're using to, to, meet, to kind of offset this if we can. And I'm not expecting you to do that. I'm just saying, keep this in mind. And this is why nighttime cough, you ask somebody about a kid, they're five year old, does he cough at night? Yeah, he lays in bed. I hear him cough almost every night. This is why, because their steroids are at their lowest, their inflammation is at their highest but that's necessary for sleep. So I think that's super important. Okay, so steroids stop inflammation. If you want an inhaler with just steroids, those are your options. 
Which one is the best? You know the answer, right? The best one is the one they can afford, always. I, no favoritism on these, okay? Now, when it comes to inhaling, if it's a dry powder, that may be more difficult for somebody who has, you know, if they have problems with inhalation capacity, but you're gonna give the one that, that works, that's cheapest that they can get, okay? This is the long acting beta agonist with the steroid. So those are the first two groups, okay? And then those two over there are all three categories. So those inhalers have a steroid, they have a long acting beta agonist, and then they have the third category, which we haven't talked about much yet, okay? All right, almost done with the categories. Oops, and then we're gonna then we'll go on. I promise. Last category is the salmas and the llamas. The, these are the muscarinics. They are anticholinergic, so they drop mucus. They dry up, right? Can't see, can't pee, can't spit. Ah, that's the one. The spit one, reducing mucus, also saliva. Um, and then they're bronchodilators. Now, here's my little point about them. Ipatropin. So anyway, the short, the long, the the llamas are the long acting, which we have um, four, I think now three or four. But teotropin is the one we're most com most uh, comfortable with and we're most experienced with. The SAMAs are the short acting, and we only have one, and that's ipatropium bromide. Okay. So ipatropium is the short acting muscarinic. It's often listed. And I put, are they are they bronchodilators? And I think this is a little bit interesting because they don't really relax muscle. Remember, albuterol relaxes that muscle, forcing calcium out of the cell. These don't. Ipatropium bromide, by the way, is, is a combination of atropine. And isopropyl alcohol, that's where the name comes from, which is, again, kind of interesting. Remember atropine? Those of you who are old enough to remember the old ACE, um, a, uh, the, the life support classes we took, and we had to remember when to give atropine. Um, works by increasing the degradation of CFG, decreasing calcium in the cell. So it blocks the contraction. So they're bronchodilators, but they really stop the contraction from happening in the first place. Pretty cool, right? So albuterol relaxes it once it is constricted. The big role for epitropium is to stop the contraction in the first place. So together they're pretty good. So let's put the short acting one and the long and and the short acting uh, beta agonist in a liquid, and we'll call it duoneb. That's what duoneb is. If I put the two in an inhaler, that's combivent. Okay, so that's why the, that's that's epitropium bromide. Onset of action about twenty minutes. It's not as fast as albuterol. Half life is a couple of hours. Okay, so that's albuterol. That's the the samas and llamas. And then I already asked this, I already answered this question with my pictures. It was better to do it there. But if they don't really have a lot of constriction, it's still helpful in reducing the tone that's there, okay? So if not overly constricted, this can be very helpful. So, and minimal, I put minimal systemic absorption because it is an anticholinergic and the total anticholinergic burden, especially on seniors is something that I'm actually was tried to thing with Epic to get where we would pop up a patient and we could see their anticholinergic burden on the screen. It would add it up for us. Nobody liked my idea, so, but that will come out long after I'm gone probably, but that's, I think it needs like a number, like you had a number, you knew what the anticholinergic burden was and am I affecting our, our senior patients? So anyway, maybe that's something this group can do. Uh, minim, but there's minimal absorption, thankfully for these. So if you just want <laughs> short acting llama, I mean, short acting uh, uh, muscarinic and a short acting uh, albuterol, there's your option, Combivent. It's just a rescue inhaler. In this case, it comes out as a mist but it's got the two short acting medicines, okay? If I just want the long acting muscarinic, those are my options, okay? So Atrovent, um, Incruz, Elliptus, Breva, um, and Tudorza. All of them are great, get whatever's covered, okay? That's fine. It's just a long acting muscarinic medicine, all right? If I want a long acting with a long acting beta agonist, those are my options, okay? So Stiolto, you may have heard that, Bevespi or Anora. So those are our options there. And then if I want all three categories, those are my inhalers, okay? I hope we're here. I hope this is making sense and kind of maybe the thing is a little less foggy. These are the three groups. When you treat asthma, you go from the albuterol to the steroids and finally to the muscarinic. That's the order of increasing. If you're doing COPD, you don't do the steroids. In fact, if I do that talk, you if you hear my talk, I'm gonna encourage you not to go to the steroid category very often, okay? So, but at the end, you do finally go. So this is the path of treatment for the two major disease states. So when we get to the guidelines, we're just gonna move up. Now I, I'll say this again, probably, but the problem when I get referrals, I look back and I do a lot of back work on my referrals. 
and I see that this just isn't done. And even though the, there may be a note that says patient's still struggling, there's no, they don't step up. So we, this is the step up therapy with asthma. You learned it in school. This is what we should be doing. What I see is that there's just a lot of hesitancy to actually do this. All right. Now that's the three, that's the three categories. Take a deep breath. Let's set that aside and we'll kind of come back to that and re reference those three. But those are the three silos of medicine we have and how we progress is different based on the disease state. The guidelines are gonna just tell us kind of how to do that. The uh, uh, upper right is the, the 2020 focused update. Bottom left is the 30 anniversary of, of Gina, okay? And so very cool guidelines, very helpful. And let's, I'm gonna talk about the changes, okay? So, oh, that, that slide is in there twice. Let's get rid of that, okay, so. Gina is on the bottom there. That's what we're going to do first. What 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 do the Gina guidelines tell me, and what do I need to know if I'm in primary care? If I maybe see asthma patients, maybe I'm an OB. I just did a talk to some um, an OBGYN group, and about what how are we doing this in in pregnancy. If you're treating, let's see what the guidelines say because there's some big some big big changes. Okay, so first change about five years ago was albuterol. Inhaled albuterol has been the first line treatment for 50 years. That's our go-to, right? That's what we give. This dates from when we thought asthma was primarily bronchoconstriction and we had a medicine, all right? The first inhaler, by the way, the first inhaled medicine for asthma, another side note, <laughs> you, take, um, you take adrenal glands, which have adrenaline, which is a form of albuterol. By the way, albuterol is just a form of adrenaline. It's a form of of it's, it does the same thing as adrenaline does, right? And epinephrine, albuterol, adrenaline, very similar. And you take dried um, adrenal glands, grind them up and inhale them. And it worked, right? Because I'm getting adrenaline, which works like albuterol. So patients rely on albuterol. It's fast, right? But albuterol relaxes constriction. We know that. Over-relying on this does not work. And it, it makes us feel like we're in control when we're not. We're not treating inflammation or mucus. So it's not good, okay? So overuse reduces the receptors. It increases how bad allergens are on us. It increases how smoke hits us. I don't have it in it, but it, it increases how we respond to viruses. Overuse of albuterol, not helpful. And it's the single most consistent factor when it comes to admission and death. So you've got to be careful. Don't overprescribe. Gina said, we're doing this and we can't. We've got to stop. We've got to stop doing that, okay? So for safety, Gina no longer recommends Saba-only treatment. They base this on the data and say, look, it, we need to not have these exacerbations. So Gina, the first big change was, hey, if you're going to give albuterol, give a steroid with it. Treat the whole thing. Treat all of asthma, okay? It, um, and this overall reduces exacerbations and death. So the U.S. guidelines also recommend this in step two. So step one doesn't recommend this, but they say it in step two. But Gina says, nope, from the beginning, you need to give a steroid. If you're giving albuterol, give a steroid to treat the whole thing. In response to that, we now have an inhaler that has albuterol and a steroid in one, okay? And so that's that came out late last year, but it's not in widespread use. This is the name, it's Air Super. I, I'm not promoting it at all. It's just, it's what's out there. It's just albuterol with budesonide. So this is out there and it is an option to use. I don't know what it's gonna cost. I haven't seen any data on it. Our pharmacy doesn't have it yet, but this was in response to the GINA guidelines, okay? Now, um, okay, so that's the first big change is if you're gonna give albuterol and they have asthma, you should give a steroid with it. A lot of us didn't do that all the time. And, and this wasn't widely picked up, okay? But in, more so in Europe, but it, it the idea is solid and that over-prescribing albuterol is not a good idea, okay? And I'll talk more about how much. The second biggest change was the idea that I can have one inhaler, one single inhaler that's my controller, that's my long acting, that lasts all day, and my rescue in one. I'm not carrying two inhalers. I've got one inhaler. So it's a single maintenance and reliever, my rescue and my maintenance in one, okay? Now, here's just some points. Remember, albuterol is fast, right? It's a, it's a beta agonist. It relaxes muscle, muscle. It comes on fast and goes away fast. 
but there is one long acting that's fast as well. And that's Formoterol. It's the only one. Formoterol is just as fast as albuterol. Most data says that it's the same speed of onset. So it's fast, but it hangs out for a long time. So albuterol has gone in a couple of hours, formoterol hangs around for about 12. Com combine this with the best inhaled steroid, budesonide, the best, I should change that term. It's, the, it's one of the smaller molecules. It's not the smallest, but it's one of the smaller ones. And it has, it, 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 the, the ability to reduce inflammation is a little better than fluticasone. And you have an excellent controller, long acting asthma control. So what about using this as needed? So I could give you an inhaler with budesonide and with formoterol. I could, that brand name would be Simbacort. Generic is out there. Okay. And I could give that to you and have you do it twice a day. Just that's what we've been doing. And that's what the FDA says you can do. But what about saying, here's this inhaler and use it as needed? That's the idea behind smart therapy, all right? It's as fast as albuterol, but lasts about 12 hours. Can this be a controller and a rescue inhaler at the same time? This is just one of the references. There's lots out there, and I'm gonna show you something in just a second from Gina that they just put out. But smart is single maintenance and reliever, and you can use it as needed. And the data is really strong, okay. Now, Gina calls this smart, so it's smart or mark, kind of depends on, US kind of refers to it as smart. Gina calls it MART therapy. Not FDA approved, but is recommended. Very reasonable to try. Right now, we're doing this in mild to moderate asthma only. Okay, severe asthma, I think it makes sense. If somebody has severe asthma, they can't really use something as needed only. They really need to be on daily therapy, although many of our patients do the as needed anyway. The, I just want to share with you the data. I'm not going to go through this. Well, let me point out a couple of things. So this is from Gina. This is their MART or SMART data. Just if you just look at the three little boxes on the left, where those the, where those darker squares are are on the left hand side, and that's the data that favors using this over all the other options. This is why there's such a strong recommendation when patients have as needed combination with a steroid like budesonide and a long acting form of albuterol. In this case, it's formoterol. They do better. And all the data supports it, whether it's using it against a steroid that somebody uses as needed or a steroid that they use twice a day with or with that albuterol, the data is strong, okay? So that's some of the data. This is how, this is kind of how Gina shows it. Smart therapy is okay. If you look on the far left, it says steps one and two, and we're gonna show you those steps in just a second, but using budesonide for motorol as an inhaler, using it one inhalation whenever needed. So if they have very mild asthma, say, hey, here's this inhaler. It's brand name Simbicort or it's generic budesonide from Motorol. Give whatever's cheaper. Usually the generic is cheaper. Although sometimes, believe it or not, I can get the brand cheaper. It depends on their, their plan. But give them, give them what's cheaper. One inhalation anytime. If they step up and they need more, I, you can do this once a day and then any, any other time. You can do it as much as needed, okay? So do it every morning but then go ahead and do it during the day whenever you need it. If they're a little bit more, maybe I could say, hey, look at do two in the morning, two at night, and then in the middle of the day, you could do as much as needed. You can do one or two extra puffs. And finally, if they're really you know, sick, they could do two in the morning, two at night, and do one whenever's needed. Now, if you treat asthma, you see this, and you there's two big issues. Number one, this is not FDA approved. That means insurance doesn't like it. And you have to be very careful how you write the prescription. I'm showing you this because literally every piece of data and every guideline change is on this right here. Don't, you know, is giving a single inhaler for rescue and controller, using it at different levels because the data is so much better, less exacerbations, higher quality of life, FEV1 goes up, less ER visits, less admissions. It shows that this works because you're getting the medicines you need. You're getting a steroid and a long-acting beta agonist at the same time, okay? So how you deal with this is, you know, too. the other big problem is that if somebody starts to do this, they're going to run out early. And that's exactly right. The inhaler that's brand name Simbacort or the generic budesonide from Motorol, that is two puffs in the morning, two puffs at night, four a day, 30 days in a month, Okay. So that's the number of puffs you get. You get 120 plus a few. 
they're not going to last if they're doing 12 or 15 puffs a day. Plus, you would want to know that, right? So that's the big one. So that's the dosing over there on the side. I just want you to know it's an option. I do this routinely with my patients. I write the prescription for two in the morning, two at night so that I can get it filled. And then I give them written instructions about how to do it. And I'll show you the written instructions in just a second. This is a little bit more on, on how to do it. And some of the uh, just kind of indications that, that Gina says, this is all from last year. The 2024 Gina is not, if it's out, I haven't read it yet. Um, and, but if you see in the middle, I point out that it says there's a maximum of 12 inhalations a day. And that's fine. That 12 is not too many and they'll do fine. The side effects from the beta agonist are not, they don't add, they're not additive. So if somebody does two puffs in the morning and two puffs at noon, they're not going to get a ton more tachycardia or anything. That actually doesn't happen. It doesn't happen with albuterol and it doesn't happen with formoterol. Those do not stack at a certain level, probably about four puffs for most people. The side effects level off and they really don't keep going up. All right. So very safe to do. And then um, this is just some more data. I just put that up there for reference. If you if, if this is something you want to to read about, you can just kind of pause the slideshow and read a little bit more about it and some of the references. So, you know, not just making this up. Um, the very last line, Jackie is the is the journal that that is the best one for me. And for if you do kind of look into any journal for asthma and allergy and and immunology, the Jackie is our practice one. And it's the one that is very really geared toward practice for family practice as well as asthma and allergy. So that's that article right there in 2022 was great about this. If you need an asthma action plan to do smart therapy, here it is. And I'll just, that's the big one. So this is a great asthma action plan. And it just says, hey, look at here's your inhaler. It's the only one you need to carry. Use it however you write here. Maybe it's once a day and then extra, or maybe it's just as needed. Okay. So that's right from Gina. All right. So three categories of medicine. How are we doing on time? Three categories of medicine. We use them differently. We know we have guidelines and the two big changes are one, don't give albuterol by itself. Give it with a steroid. Again, whether you do that or not, it's up to you. This is Gina's just saying, do this, okay? The second thing is, look at if, if we're going to give a long-acting beta agonist and a steroid together, we can use them as needed. You can use it once a day and then as needed. You can use it twice a day and then as needed. It may be a struggle to get covered, but the data says that this is far superior to the old way of saying, here's your steroid twice a day. Here's your albuterol anytime. You could still do that. And maybe you have to for whatever reason, but doing it this way is better. It's just better in every category. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop saying, I keep saying that over and over. A little more about the guidelines and what they talk about. The only thing I want to do in the diagnosis, well, a couple things. I just, I'll go through this very quickly, but Gina had made a very important change that I think is, is critical to family practice and those of you who don't practice in asthma every day and those of you who may not have access to spirometry or PFTs. So this is the typical course. Top box says, do they look like they have asthma? Yep. Do they have a history that supports asthma? Yep. You get a spirometry or PFT and they reversed? Yep. Asthma. Great. Great. That's, the, that's what we learned in school walks, looks, and talks like asthma, I test them, and they get PFTs or sperm they've got asthma. Look on the side. If they don't have a history, they don't cough, remember? I have I had a patient, two, not last week, but the week before, 61-ish, and diagnosed with asthma, onset at age 58. Does that, <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever talk to your dog and your dog goes like that? So I always tell people, if you do this to a patient, <laughs> get a PFT, because if you're going, what? You know, if that, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. You had no asthma, no allergic history, no family history, and you just developed asthma at age 58. It's not going to be asthma, right? I mean, I, the, I, I appreciate that they sent the patient to me, but the diagnosis of asthma is completely irrelevant. I mean, I mean, they, I guess it's possible, but 98% of the time, that's going to be a COPD or a restricted lung disease. You don't just get asthma at age 58 usually. So Gina says, look, if it doesn't look, walk, or talk like asthma, then look for something else. And then if they, if everything looks like asthma and you get spirometry, that's normal quote, which is a whole nother talk, which I hope I can do because that whole idea of normal spirometry for both asthma and COPD is a problem. But if you get that, then, then it says, go ahead and try them on a treatment and then recheck. This is the point I wanted to show you. Patient comes in. It sounds like it might be asthma. Their history supports it. 
but for whatever reason, you can't get spirometry or you don't have time to get spirometry or the spirometry lab is closed because of COVID or whatever. Gina says, look it, go ahead and treat them. Treat them appropriately. In this case, it would be with either an albuterol and a steroid or smart therapy, whatever, but treat them. Have them come back and see what happened. How did you do? And if they come back and like, oh my word, this was amazing. Or they're you know, like, my kid doesn't cough at night anymore. You can diagnose asthma based on a robust response to therapy. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. People won't, they kind of don't like to give the diagnosis of asthma, but if they really respond and the Gina has, you know, how do I monitor? What does really respond mean? Well, I don't get into it, but they, the next slide has a little bit on there. Okay. So I'm showing it to you. I'm just not going to get into the details of what that means, but you know, if you think about albuterol or, or for motorol, it, it's a, it's a medicine and it's a test. It's your test. It's like giving nitroglycerin for angina. I mean, it is the test. What symptom do you have? Um, I was coughing. Okay. Did you do your albuterol? Yep, I did. Two puffs. What happened? My cough was gone in one minute. Okay. Did you do it? Yeah. Five times I took albuterol for my cough and every time the cough went away. Okay. That's spirometry right there. Now I'm still going to get spirometry, but they just answered your question. Right. I mean, they could be making it up and albuterol is a stimulant a little bit. So maybe they just feel good. But but if you have symptoms and they respond, Gina says, go ahead and diagnose them. And then when you can, test them, figure it out. Because sometimes we miss things. All right. So that's that's what they say on that. This is the data. I'm not going to get into this. And what does it mean? And how do you notice? But you can do peak flow and monitor them without doing spirometry. If you do spirometry, that's the, the data right there in the middle. Okay. And it's an increase, either their volume or their, their speed, or both go up, okay? That's how they do it. This, I don't really, oh, my box up the side. I don't really have time, but this is just, this is just, there's my Yorkies in the background, sorry. Ignore the dogs. But that is just showing you that there's a reversibility component. And so they, they did the breathing test, they got albuterol, it relaxed and opened, and now they're better, okay? That's the reversibility. In this particular one, 20% change. Okay, so that's the diagnosis. Just treat them if you need to and monitor their response. When we get into the guidelines too, the other part is just determine whether they're in, see, are they in control? So every time a patient comes in, every time, whether they're sick or not, your primary job is to find out, hey, is it working, right? Because we've already diagnosed them. So that's different. We've already done that. I need to determine if they're in control. Are they doing well? If they're having an exacerbation, Ask them how they do when they're not sick. You're going to have one plan for getting them better and another plan for keeping them better. So, hi, Mrs. Jones. I know you're not feeling good today. No, you've been sick. Okay. You had COVID or you whatever. You had an RSV, whatever. You had a viral infection. I need to treat your asthma today and get you off of this exacerbation. So, maybe we're going to do a macrolide or prednisone or whatever. But I need to know... When you're not sick, how do you do? What's going on when you're not sick? Do you Are you able to breathe normally? Can you do the things you want to do? And so let's treat you, but then let's get you on a therapy that keeps you better. This is the single best way to determine how they're doing. This is a question you ask. And if they're sick, you want to say, how are you doing when you're not sick? So look at this and how are you doing when you're not sick? Okay. This is the cycle that Gina recommends. You're going to diagnose them in the upper right. They're going to get treatment. You're going to have them come back and ask them, how are you doing? Are you, can you do the things you want to do? Are you active? Can you, can you do what you want to do? Good asthma control means minimal symptoms. They can do what they want to do. They're not coughing at night when their steroids are lowest. Can they do what they want? I ask kids, what do you do at recess? I play soccer. Okay. Can you play soccer? And I, if I had, if I had a dollar, if I had a, 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 a chronologic log of every time a kid has said, well, I play for five minutes and then I stop because I can't breathe or, and I, and I say, do you copy? Yeah. The parent has no idea or they do PE and they stop. So find out what they're doing. No severe flares, minimal sob use. And I asked them, okay, if you're using your, your, your albuterol or if it's smart therapy, when you're using your rescue inhaler, tell me why you did that. Why did you reach for that inhaler? What made you reach for it? Well, I was coughing. Okay. Did the cough better? So I don't, I don't, I'm not concerned about the fact that they got their inhaler as much as I am. What happened that made you think I need it? That symptom is what I want to know. 
and I want to minimize that symptom because it made you think I need help. If somebody goes through, I need, I need an inhaler, but pretend this is my inhaler. It's not, it's a pen. It's cheaper than an inhaler. If somebody has an inhaler and it's albuterol for the sake of argument, that has 200 puffs, 200 puffs. If somebody goes through one of those in a month, that means 100, they do two puffs at a time, 100 times in that month, they thought I need help. A hundred times. And they used their inhaler a hundred times in a month. Don't refill that. That is not okay. Do not do that. Something is going on. A lot of times it's not related to asthma and they're just doing it. Okay, that's fine. That's habitual use. Find out. But, but if they go through it in two months, 60 days, so 100 times in the last 60 days, you felt the need for help and you reach for your inhaler. Tell me what happened and why. And did your inhaler work? Was it helpful? All right. Rule of twos, you should not use your inhaler more than twice a week or more than two inhalers a year. This is evolving as we do more smart therapy, but that's kind of the, the old adage of the rule of twos. And it's a really good kind of rule to go by because that means more than twice a week, they thought I need help, something's up. Two More than two times a week, control was not achieved. All right, all right, so the GINA guidelines, 30 years, these are the best. I just say that nah, I need to get rid of the word best, uh, get rid of that because that's not a good word, but they are the most current and they're most updated. Um, good for the non-asthma specialist as well. So they're really geared towards the family practice or general practitioner that's not doing asthma full time. Um, and it's their 30th year. Okay. So that's the Gina. Let's look at that. So yeah, here's the guideline. It's overwhelming, right? All these things, all these guidelines, but keep in mind, we have the three categories and we know the three categories well. Okay. We know which order to go in and we kind of understand the diagnosis part. So this is easy. Gina says, hey, look it, you've got these steps. Step one, this is the first track on top. This is how Gina does it. Preferred control and reliever using, so right there on the left, left-hand side of that red box, using ICS for motor oil, that means steroid. Remember, ICS is a steroid and for motor oil as the reliever. Now, budesonide for motor oil is the most common one, but there is mometazone for motor oil as well. Um, brand name Dulera is out there. So it, it doesn't matter. Again, whatever's covered. This reduces the risk of exacerbations compared to using just a, a, a bit agonist, okay? And it's simpler. So steps one to two says, hey, here's your, here's your, here it is, brand name Simbacort, Dulera, generic for motor oil, whatever. Here's the cheapest thing. Just use it whenever you need to. Just use it whenever. It's your rescue inhaler and it's your controller. That's what Gina's saying. So now when you see the guidelines, you know exactly what they're referring to. Track two says an alternative control and reliever before considering a regimen with Saba reliever, check to see. So they do us, this is the kind of the older guidelines, even though they're only a few years old. Look at here's albuterol and here's a steroid. When you do the albuterol, do the steroid. Now remember those two just got combined into a new inhaler, Air Supra, which is coming out now. So if you choose to do that, that's fine. Whatever this, Whatever works for you, okay? Neither of these are FDA, uh, well, well the, the bottom one's not, is, is FDA approved, the top one's not, but these are both guidelines. So however you wanna do it. Then you have them come back. How are you? Are you doing okay? Can you sleep at night? Do you do well? Can you do the activities you wanna do? Are you in control? Here's the asthma control test. Tell me about your symptoms. If you're sick today, how do you do normally? Ask those questions. Determine, see that little circle on the top where it says assess, adjust, and review? Determine how they're doing. Do I need to step you up? Do I need to stay there? Whatever, you know, whatever makes sense, okay? So this is the guidelines and now you know them. You don't have, there's nothing to memorize. We know the three categories. We know how to step up. We can give them this long acting combination that we call smart therapy. I can give them a steroid with albuterol but this is what's out there. This is what is becoming the community standard and we need to know. So this is how to do it, all right? Then step up therapy if need be, okay? Make that change. Remember that I said that's this is where I see people get stuck here and they don't go forward, okay? Step three, four, and five, doesn't matter which track you're on, I'm just gonna give you a little more, increase the dose. Maybe I'll go from as needed to once a day, then as needed, or twice a day, then as needed. 
And maybe I'll do that with just one inhaler and it's smart therapy, or maybe I'll do that with two inhalers. I'm giving you, uh, you know, maybe Advair, Wixella or, or whatever, fluticasone with, with salmeterol, whatever I give you with albuterol, that's kind of the old way of thinking, but I'm going to step you up. As you step up at some point, in this case, it's step five. They say, hey, add on a llama. See that? Is that little right below the word step five? That's the third category. All right. So they say, give them one or two categories, depending on where you are and what you can afford. Step them up, give them a higher dose, make it more consistent rather than PRN, and then add a llama. Just keep going. At some point, you would think about, hey, do I need to refer them? Where that happens is based on community standards and what they can afford. Lots of questions there. But we know that specialists are more likely to treat aggressively and use biologics. And the other thing is, at some point, I'm going to add in Montelukast, and I have a slide coming up on that. So this is it. This is all the guidelines you need to know. And the U.S. guidelines are very similar, so it's not going to take any time at all. Three categories. I start based on what they can afford and what I want to do, but smart therapy is the best if you can give it. Advance them as they go up, increase the dose, be more regular, add on that third category when I can, if need be. Consider referral at that point, okay? That's it. That's the guidelines. And if you kind of get that, you're at. Now, step five says add on llama, refer for assessment, and consider doing, um, you know, doing more therapy. Now, the box at the bottom, which is small print, because I'm going to cover it here in just a second. So ignore the little fine print, because I'm going to cover that here in the next slide, next couple of slides. Okay. Now, so I made it bigger. Sorry, I forgot. I, I did. I'm like, that's so small. So th th this is that I'm just going to blow it up right there. So it says add on llama, refer for assessment. Teotropium spiriva is the llama. That's the most common. There are other ones. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to give preference to, to, to that company, but that's the one we're most comfortable with. Okay. So you can give that. That's an add on llama. The biologics are at the bottom of that first box. Those medicines, the best way to think about a biologic is when it works, it doesn't make asthma better. It tends to make asthma gone or close to gone. In fact, just last year, for the first time ever, we have definitions for what it means to be an asthma remission. We're not going to get into that, but it's very interesting that for the first time, we have well-recognized and agreed upon definition of remission. Crazy to think of that, right? But we do. That is an antibiotic, right? z -pack, right? You always say patients come in and they should just put on their chief complaint. Uh, they have a z -pack deficiency, right? <laughs> They're deficient. They haven't had their z -pack this month. Um, that's funny because it's funny and I said it and it's always funny, but it is very true that macrolide antibiotics are very helpful when it comes to asthma in certain conditions. With COPD, they're almost always beneficial during exacerbation, but with asthma, they can be because they're really an anti-inflammatory. So we're using the antibiotic as an antibiotic on the outside chance, the two in 100 chance that they have a, a bacterial infection or co-infection, um, but it, it is a very good anti-inflammatory. So I have a slide coming up on that in just a second. This is my slide on, on, on Montelukast. So Montelukast is singular, a very good medicine. I put Montelukast is very helpful for asthma, but not for allergic rhinitis, okay? So in the guideline, right, in, in, this, in this guideline, as I step up, adding on, if it's at the very bottom of the third step three, it says step three, then step three, then very bottom, it says add on an LTRA, which is Montelukast, okay? So it's saying, go ahead and add that on at this point. So that's from step three forward, it's adding this is great. The FDA says, yeah, do that, but don't do it for just allergic rhinitis. And I don't think anybody's doing that. So I don't know that that's happening. But anyway, um, consider though, that there is the possibility, although there's no link to increase suicidal ideation and, and, and suicide attempts or completion, there's at least the, the concern that it's out there. So consider the black box warnings, but this is really helpful if they have allergic asthma. So if they have allergies, eczema, allergic rhinitis and asthma, or any combination in there, you really need to use this. And I put, this is a must, this isn't a might, this isn't a, you should. If they have been on steroids even once, the biggest benefit of Montelukast is that it's steroid sparing. Patients on Montelukast 
appropriate patients have less steroids, both inhaled and oral. So that's why we really want to try it. Okay. And it's also, and I don't know, maybe you know this. I ask people and they don't always know it. Montelukast is excellent, excellent for exercise induced bronchospasm. Okay. So if you have patients with exercise asthma and you want to give them albuterol, that's great. If they want to do two puffs of albuterol only, they don't need a steroid generally. This is the kind of the caveat to the guidelines. But if they have exercise induced asthma and you want to give them two puffs before exercise, great. Maybe they do it at before a basketball game or before practice. If they say to me, I did two puffs before my basketball game and I was great. I could breathe the whole time. I didn't do two puffs at halftime. I didn't cough. I was great. Then that's it. Okay, use it whenever you want to. You don't need it very often. You do great. Everybody else, I'm going to add Montelukast. So if they need to redose at halftime or if it's not quite getting there or they're still coughing, I'm going to add Montelukast if I can. Okay, so that's it. And that's kind of a tip there. All right. Um, the U.S. guidelines are very similar to GINA. So this is what's cool. This is the 2020 focused update. They really, the, I don't get into it, but they, they, they asked six questions and answered those six questions. However, the questions were asked um, six years or so before the guidelines came out. And then they were answered three years before they were published. And so by the time they were published and answered, they kind of had changed the question and some of the problems. So I'm not getting into those, but you can read that if you want. Oops, the guidelines are very similar to Gina. Step one says just do albuterol, right? So the US guidelines don't have that steroid thing in the beginning. But then in step two, they say, okay, now we're going to mimic Gina. We're going to give a steroid plus as needed albuterol. And then, <clears throat> and then we're just going to advance. So everything else is kind of the same. Add in Montelukast. Consider adding in that third category of muscarinics. If you get a little bit further down the line, consider referral for biologics and, and move on. Okay. That's kind of the goal. So this is a blow up of that step one and two daily low dose steroid. Um, oops. I'm, uh, and as needed uh, with as needed. So at, at the very beginning, here's albuterol and that's it. If I need to step you up, I'm going to go albuterol with steroid. And then I'm going to go from there. Gina says, start with albuterol and steroid from the beginning and do them together, okay? This is just some of the data that they have in the US guidelines. I just wanna make that box bigger. So I know that's small. So let me blow that single box up and show it to you. Individuals 12, so use albuterol as needed. The intensity of treatment depends on the severity of symptoms. Remember, I, I, in, I said that before. The US guidelines made a point of saying, hey, this is okay. Do two puffs, wait a few minutes. If you need to do two more, do two more, okay? Wait a minute. If you need to do two more, do two more. Don't tell your patients to wait four hours between doing the albuterol. The four hour number is complete bunk. It doesn't make any sense and it's not, it's not, it's not appropriate at all. You have to kind of write the prescription that way to get it filled sometimes, but it, it's bunk. Two puffs, anytime. Cough, shortness of breath, wheeze, anything. See what it does. Because when I see you back, I'm gonna say, what made you, what made you reach your inhaler? This is still an inhaler. This is not a pen. What made you reach for that? Okay, that symptom, I couldn't breathe. Did it help? If you need to repeat it, sometimes those first two puffs open you up and the next two get in, right? The first two got me to the point where the next two could actually get in deeply. Make sure they're doing their inhaler right. Inhaler technique is a whole other video. And you can do that up to three times, okay? And you can do it with a nebulizer up to three times or any combination. Um, and then... The second bullet point, the last few words say you can do up to 12 puffs a day. And that's what Gina says as well. We have good data that doing up to 12 puffs of a long acting medicine a day is fine. But you and I both know that if they do 12 puffs a day, they're going to run out, right? Which maybe is good because then I need to see them. Like, why are you doing 12 puffs? <laughs> Did it help? Good. Okay, I'm glad it helped. This is just for little kids, zero to four. They say um, the one big change, did I make that box bigger? I didn't. The only thing that's different on this pretty much is that second line in that red box, at the start of a respiratory tract infection, it's okay to add a steroid. Now we've been doing this and I hope you've been doing this. And in some form, if you have a kid, any age, doesn't have to be a kid, I don't know why I said kid, but this is the guidelines for zero to four. If you have a patient who's not on a steroid and maybe it seems like they don't need it for whatever reason, and we could debate that, but they're not on a steroid and they're sick, it's perfectly okay to add that steroid for a couple of weeks. And I would do two weeks. Shortest time I would do is two weeks. So hi, 
Mrs. Jones, Miss whatever you're, I don't want to say Jones. Uh, your two-year-old is sick. We're going to add in maybe a steroid inhaler with a spacer, or here's a nebulizer. And I'm going to give you budesonide, which is brand name Pulmacort, twice a day for two weeks. And then we'll see about pulling little Jimmy Joe off. <laughs> I live in Idaho. I can say Jimmy Joe. Um, anyway, so that's okay. We've been doing it forever. And my question would be, do they need to stay on the steroid long term? But if you do this, you have a guideline to back you up in court. Um, then you just come, when they come in, you're going to review. So, uh, so all the guidelines are is starting, depending on where you, what guideline, and then advancing them up, giving them Montelukast. Make sure you do that. Don't forget giving them a higher dose of steroid, going from as needed to twice a day, finally adding in that third category and then referral if need be. That's all the guidelines. The other things that to consider, is there something else making them worse? And this would be wonderful if we could spend a lot of time on these comorbid things, but GERD, treat GERD all the time and it really can. And then this is just how often to follow up with patients. I see pregnant patients monthly. I'm just, I'm not gonna not see them monthly, even if they're pretty well controlled. Um, and then I just put inhaled steroids should not be stopped during pregnancy. In fact, if anything, I'm, the tendency should be to, I don't, I'm not saying just bump them up for no reason, but I'm saying if you need it, don't hesitate to bump that up, okay? And then do you ever step patients down and guidelines say after three months, nobody that I know does that. That doesn't make any sense because three months from now we're in a new season. So I don't know what's gonna happen seasonally, things vary. So can you stop them? Sure. And after a while you should, my minimum is a year. That's what most I think in my field do. We're not gonna pull them off very quickly, okay? All right, how are we doing? I think we're, okay, I'm gonna wrap it up. I think, I don't know how many slides I have left. I don't think I have very many. If you're still with me, thank you. You can take the rest of the day off with pay. I just decided. Um, the exacerbation. That's when we see patients a lot. They come in because they're sick. Remember that you're gonna treat them today and get them better, but then you really wanna try to treat them in the future to keep them better. So you need to do both. My experience is that that doesn't happen very often, that we just deal with the acute problem, okay? But you gotta say, how do you do when you're not sick? Are you in control? Do you know, is little Jimmy Joe, does he play? Can he play with his brother and sister? Does he stop to cough when he laughs? If he laughs, does he cough? Does he cough at night in bed when his steroids are lowest? Find out what they're doing. Ask Jimmy Joe if he plays, you know, recess. Are you doing the things? Kids with asthma don't always, it doesn't announce itself sometimes. I will say they get sick more often. So that re recurrent infection or recurrent, let me back up. Let me stop for a second. Kids with asthma, they, they, they may get sick more often, but for this sake of argument, let's pretend that they don't get sick more often, that asthma kids get sick at the same rate as every other kid which is multiple viral up respiratory infections every year. Now, they may get sick a little more frequently, but that really doesn't matter. The asthma, 10 kids in the room, 10 kids get sick on a Monday. They all get the same viral infection. And I don't really care what the viral infection is. These are five-year-olds. I don't, I mean, if it's RSV, fine. If it's COVID, fine. If it's, you know, if it's influenza, it's different because I'm going to get them on something. But assuming it's not a treatable viral infection, so it's not influenza and I'm not going to treat COVID. I don't really care what the virus is. 10 kids get sick, four or five days later, nine of the kids start to get better. The asthma kid doesn't. They get more sick, more symptomatic. The parents will say it dropped into their chest, more cough, more mucus, more phlegm. That's asthma. That's how asthma presents in little kids. Cough when they play, cough at recess, nighttime cough, sick, parents will have to say more often, but it's probably not, that's probably not the issue anyway. It's that it really does cause all this inflammation that the other kids don't get. Their body is ripe for inflammation. And as soon as they get sick with whatever, it drops in their chest. So what you are treating is that. It's the aftermath of this viral infection and this prolonged cough and mucus production, and prolonged inflammation and bronchoconstriction. That's what we're going after with the exacerbation, okay? When you have significant increase in, in albuterol, wheezing, you need to treat. Options, you can increase the meds they already have. Hey, you're on you know, smart therapy once a day, let's go to twice a day, okay? So you can do that. You can increase what they already have. 
you can add in a macrolide, okay? So adding in a macrolide, I think I did add a slide on that in a second. Add in an oral prednisone in some form, right? Try to right, do that. Now, if you do prednisone, a couple of things, kids, a half to one milligram per kilogram is often enough. You can dose it once a day. If you dose it at night, it, um, you can do like, if you're gonna do morning, then maybe do morning and like four in the afternoon. Um, so some, maybe they get some sleep, but you can usually, usually kids can be dosed daily and do just fine, okay? Adults, I put 40 milligrams for two days, 20 milligrams for three days. That's often plenty for asthma. They don't have to go longer. Um, consider nebulized therapy. So if they're struggling, maybe they need to go on a nebulizer for a while. I'm a big fan of nebulizers when I'm not certain the inhaler is getting in for whatever reason, age, coordination, muscle strength, hand strength, whatever. I'm a big fan of nebulizers because it's a known quantity. They can do it and get it in. All right. And in the end, you're going to try to figure out what happened. What, you know, why did this exacerbation happen? Did they run out of medicines or was it just a viral, whatever? Some notes on PO steroids. Tapering, you know, you don't have to taper. Well, I just said taper just a second ago, didn't I? I said, you don't have to taper. You don't have to taper. And in fact, I would encourage you to never, ever, ever put a patient on a steroid dose that requires tapering for this, for something else, it's fine. I'm talking about asthma or COPD. So tapering is not because you have to, it's because you can. You can give them. It takes less to keep them better than it does to get them better. So I'm tapering because I can. I like this. This is my thing. I've never seen any data on it. If there is, show, share it to me. I For the right patient, for the right patient, not everybody. But I'll here's 20, here's 10, 15, whatever, prednisone, 20 milligram pills. Here you go, take them. What I want you to do is take two a day, every day till you're about halfway there. And then you drop to one a day until you're back to baseline, okay? And again, this is in the right patient, the one that you, you know is gonna do it. I provide a written plan. But this gives them the ability to taper quicker if they can or hang on a little longer, all right? And I'm not going to give them enough to do anything anyway. I'm not giving them 100 prednisone. But I like that. I call it daily dosing. You're going to take 40 milligrams. And then every day when you wake up, you're going to get up and walk around and take a shower and then decide, do I need 40 milligrams today? Uh, I'm not quite there. Okay, I keep going. But then as soon as they can, they can drop to 20. This is for adults, obviously. Don't do this on a two-year-old or you will be having another lecture. Um, note on nebulizers, nebulizers, known quantity. They, they really can do well. We don't want to rely on them, but man, I think they're nice to have. I just put, if you're doing Pomacort, which is generic budesonide, it's okay to add the albuterol right in there. You can put it in the same one, you can pour them both in this, that same volume, it makes it longer, but it does work. And then, um, I just, if you are using a short acting medicine for asthma, you can really always should use Duoneb, which is albuterol and epitropium. Um, under two, we don't have a lot of data, but over two, I would use both if you can. And I, you, you don't have to give the whole thing. Um, I Parents say, you know, it takes so long and they get hyper. You, if, if, if they're mild, they're not doing too bad and you want to give a half a treatment and turn it off and set it right next to the bed and then they can do the rest in the middle of the night if they need it. Now, I'm not, I'm, this isn't severe patients. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about, you know, towards the end of these infections. And then I put through the other thing you can do if you're doing a nebulizer is, I, you know, hey, mom, is there a game on your phone that they really like, or can you download one? And the rule is they can only play on that game with their mask on, all right? They don't have to be actually hooked up to the nebulizer, but like they put the mask on and then they can play that game. And pretty soon kids wear the mask all day and it, they don't want to take it off. And so it, and in some ways you have to like, no, no more nebulizers today, I told you. Um, so that's just a little tip for little kids. Um, okay, so I thought I had another thing on, uh, I don't. I thought I had a thing on, on macrolides, but macrolide antibiotics, just a side note, azithromycin is the one we use most. And, uh, but, but the, the, Paul, the, the things that apply to macrolides may apply to doxy and some other things, but they are very, very potent anti-inflammatory without being a steroid. So sometimes you can get by with using a macrolide for five days without the prednisone, not always, of course, but it is an option. And in COPD, I recommend it a lot. In asthma, less so, but it can be helpful. And I'm pretty successful if kids are doing the right in ther inhaled therapies or nebulized therapies. If I'm going to add on a PO medicine, start with azithromycin for a couple of days. If they're not getting there, then add the prednisone. Um, again, that's got to be in a that's got to be a kid you're not worried about ending up in the ER, right? That's those those labile asthma kids, or if they've had status asthmaticus, that doesn't that they're not going to qualify. 
All right. I think I got a couple slides on biologics. Not much. I just put biologics are life-changing when they work. They don't always work. There's some patients that I have one right now that I dealt with last week that it's, I don't know. I don't know what happened. They, she just didn't get better on our second biologic. Something weird's going on. But patients with high eosinophils or IG do especially well, although that's not required for some of them. And I just put refer patients early on if they're struggling, if they're on lots of steroids, please let us help. Okay. If you want to do blood tests, if you want to get a CBC and get a total serum IG, we're help. That's great. That's helpful. Uh, yeah. In fact, I'm done. This is so that's biologics. They're out there, they're evolving, very helpful, very expensive. But the side effect profile is amazing. It's nothing, it's almost nothing. And um, anyway, very well tolerated. So in the right patient, it's wonderful. And there's a disparity between low income not getting this. So I'm not telling you to give it preferentially to low income, but I would just encourage you to really keep that in mind that some patients that, that don't get the same attention, make sure we're doing that for them, okay, especially. Um, that's an asthma action plan. So if you want, that's that same asthma and allergy network. If you want that, that's the same uh, website I gave you before. Wonderful to do these, have them in the room, write them up. Um, and encourage the kids to get along, um, to, to be a part of that. That's the asthma action plan. That's the link. Sorry. And then there's an inhaler technique video. I don't know if that link will work well, but inhaler technique super important and just encourage you to practice with them, treat, train a couple of your MAs to do this in clinic so they can train them. And so when I go into the room, the, the, the asthma control test, their scores are filled out. I can see that. I don't have to worry about it. They've had an inhaler technique gone through by, you know, if you have a trained MA and all that stuff's done when you go in the room so that you have time to, to, to do the asthma therapy. That again is me. That's my phone number and email. And if you want to reach out to me anytime, happy to answer your asthma questions. Thanks for sticking around.